Hello, my name is Sarah Clear with the Rediscovery Centre and today I'm doing this video for Mead Libraries um, and it's all about science investigations. So this is a video that you can play in your classroom and there's going to be um, some, sci some science investigations that you can do along with the video as well. So, um, Mead Libraries is presenting this science workshop with our, myself at the Rediscovery Centre. And it's part of National Science Week as well. And it's very kindly, kindly funded by Mead Libraries and Mead County Council. So first of all, we're going to talk through what do you think science is? We're going to talk about the importance of science in our daily lives, some science of the future. And then I'm going to show you some very cool investigations that you could do in your classroom. So first of all, what do you think science actually is? What words or pictures come into your head when you hear of science? So if you guys in your pod groups want to have a little chat about that, you can pause the video and talk about what you think science is. So science is a process or a way of thinking that helps us understand things, how things work and how, thing, how things came to be the way that they are. So in the scientific process or science thinking, it's all about making an observation, so looking at something, then asking a question about it. What made that thing happen? Then making a hypothesis, so thinking about, oh, I wonder what caused that. I think it might have been this. Then you're going to do some experiments um, to see if what your hypothesis or what you thought was actually correct. Then you're going to draw conclusions. So learn from your experiments. Was what you thought correct or not correct? And then it's all about reporting your results. So that is a scientific process or scientific thinking. And that's what science is all about. By following this way of thinking, we can discover very clearly um, more about our world, more about what we think, is what we're thinking right or wrong. So it's a really, really good process to use when trying to discover new things. So science can help us understand more about the universe, more about planets and galaxies. So this picture here is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, and it was taken by the Hubble telescope, which is a massive telescope that is out in space at the moment, taking pictures and discovering things all about our universe. So with this picture and with science like this, what scientists can do is they can really study images like this and figure out how far away the Andromeda galaxy is from us. Is it, tra it travelling closer to our own galaxy, the Milky Way, or is it moving away from us? How big is it? How many stars are there? And is there a supermassive black hole at the centre of the Andromeda galaxy? Wow, so lots of very cool science we can discover about different planets. Scientists are also trying to discover, could human beings ever live on another planet? And as part of that, we're, uh, scientists are constantly sending out um, exploration um, air, uh, spacecraft and satellites and even rovers to different planets as well to discover more about them. So hopefully in the future, and not too distant future, there might be humans able to live on the planet Mars, but there's a lot of science that needs to be done before um, we can actually go there. Is there enough water or do we need to bring all the water we need with us? Is there going to be any problems with the gravity? Will we be able to grow food in the soil on Mars? These are all really big questions that scientists are trying to discover the answers to. But science doesn't just help us discover things about the universe and planets and our solar system. It also helps us discover more about our own planet. And this is a picture of the Giant's Causeway up in Northern Ireland. Now, it's an incredible picture. It's an incredible place. There's this, inc this amazing rock formation that looks like stepping stones. It's columns of hexagonal rock. And there's some great stories about how this came to be the way it was, but the science of it is even better. Millions of years ago, there was an enormous volcano that erupted in what is now Northern Ireland. And as the lava came down the side of the volcano and hit cold seawater, it transformed into la from lava into this type of rock. So it is quite incredible. When you're standing on the Giant's Causeway, you're actually standing on ancient lava. So very cool stuff as well. 
Science also helps us learn more about living things and also creatures lived a long time ago that are extinct now. So scientists can study images and bones and fossils and they can discover from their science investigations more about what an animal might have looked like when it was alive. How big was it? What it might have eaten? What kind of place it lived in? So this incredible image is one of the amazing pleosaurs that used to live um, in the ancient oceans. And from, the, from its teeth, you could tell that it was a carnivore. So pretty cool image too. And those are some of the different things that science helps us to discover. So there's different types of sciences. Uh, one type is like the life sciences, the study of living things. Another type of science is physical science, which is the study of energy, forces and matter. So what things are made of. Earth science is the study of earth and space. With all those different types of science, you can imagine that people work in many different areas and many different types of science that relates to our daily lives. So some scientists will work on technology, coming up with incredible inventions like a smart watch, where you can make phone calls and have text messages through your watch. They also come up with some incredible new technologies as well, all the time that we're using. So every time you get a new device, have a think about the scientists that would have um, come up with the idea, that would have tested everything out, that would have done experiments to improve it constantly. And you see how much science is all around us and is part of our life every day. There's also food scientists who really help us in terms of what kind of food we're actually eating. So food scientists would do things like examining um, our food, different ice cream, how things are grown. And they look at things in lots of different ways, making sure the uh, food we're eating isn't poisonous for us, very important, that it tastes good, that it's not going to be bad for our health as well and cause um, cause obesity or too much sugar and things like that. So there's actually quite a lot of science in our food as well. And anytime you look on the, on the packaging, on any type of food, you'll see some of the science that was involved in that as well, calculating how many calories are in your food or exactly what percentage of different ingredients are there as well. Other scientists then would study things like fossils and creatures that might lived a long time ago. So if you have a look at this image here, you will see this incredible image of a paleontologist, so a scientist who's studying the, bo the fossil bones of this dinosaur. And you'll see just how big that fossil actually is. If you see the size of the man there, and then you can see the top of the leg bone. So that's from the hip to the knee of the dinosaur. And it's nearly the same size as the scientist. Huge. The scientists will also help us with things as well, like uh, coming up with new designs for aeroplanes to make them faster, more efficient, better for the environment. And even with our cars as well, there's a lot of science that goes into cars and vehicles. So now I would like you to close your eyes and I would like you to try and think about a world without science. What would that world be like? What kind of things would we be missing? No technology, no TV, internet. We'd have a lot of our clothes are made using science as well. We'd have no medicines and no clean water. And we would not understand much about our world and how things work. And we might still think that the earth was flat. So have a think yourselves as well and think about all the other stuff we'd be missing if it wasn't for science. So we're so lucky we do have science in our lives and possibly in the future, some of you might be scientists working in some different areas. Now I want to tell you about some of the science of the future. This is things that scientists are working on right now. And when you grow up, that you might get involved in as well or things that you might use in the future. This is all science that's probably 10, 15, 20 years away, but will be happening in the future. So one of the first ones then is the um, 3D printer. Now I'm sure you know printers, they print flat in 2D and you might have seen 3D pr printers that can print in three dimensions like my cup here. But what scientists are doing at the moment is they're trying to come up with a way of printing with something that's kind of like human tissue, so a little bit like skin. <clears throat> so that if anybody 
has a problem with their heart or a bad heart, that scientists might be able to 3D print them a new heart in the future, and then doctors can put it in them and save their life, help them be healthier. So that is a really, really exciting development. And have a think about what other things could scientists do with a 3D printer. What kind of thing would you like to see 3D printed in the future? And maybe you might work on that um, in your future job. Um, another image here is of um, packaging. So packaging is a huge problem at the moment. Often if we're taking a drink of something like from a juice box, we drink it really quickly within five or 10 minutes and then we throw it away and it's causing problems for the environment when it gets thrown away as waste. So scientists are trying to come up with alternative or better solutions to this problem. And one of them is this. So it's packaging that when the ingredient inside it is used, the packaging will decompose or rot away really quickly and turn into water and natural ingredients that won't cause any problems for the environment. So that's a very exciting one. And again, it's quite a bit in the future, but it is very exciting. Scientists are also trying to develop new types of transportation, such as this aeroplane here. So this is a computer model of an aeroplane that's being designed by scientists at the moment. And it's going to be almost twice as fast as one of the aeroplanes that we use now. It's more energy efficient and better for the environment. And this particular model, when it's built, will be able to carry 840 passengers. Very exciting. The other image here is of a new type of train called a Hyperloop, and it's basically a metal tube inside another metal tube. It works on magnetism, and it will be able to go up to approximately, scientists are estimating, maybe 850 kilometers an hour. Incredibly fast, and it will be amazing in the future if we can do that. So that's just a little bit about science. So now you guys are going to be the scientists and you guys are going to do some science investigations. Now the first one I'm going to show you here is a hoop aeroplane. So this type of aeroplane, instead of like a paper aeroplane, this is an alternative design that you can do a lot of science with as well. So I've made this one here using a compostable straw. Um, but you could also use some rolled up paper as well, if you'd prefer, and some cardboard. Um, the other things you'll need are sellotape, scissors, a ruler, and some scrap cardboard as well. So you're going to be making a version of this. So to start off and make a model like this one, what you need to do is you need to carefully measure and draw out <coughs> two strips of cardboard that you're going to cut out. Now I've put these quite far apart just to show you. So the first one is 15 centimeters by two centimeters. The second one is 30 centimeters by two centimeters. If you're doing this yourself at home, you want to put them closer together so you're wasting less as well, because that's always really good for the environment. So when you've got that done, you're going to draw those out, make sure they're as straight as possible, then cut them out. And what you'll be left with is two strips of cardboard like this. So these two strips then, if you bend them around and turn them into a hoop and put a little bit of tape in there, just hold them in place. Try not to flatten them as you're doing this as well. So you've got your two hoops then all ready to go. And what you can do then is you're going to tape them on quite strongly onto either your straw or your rolled up cardboard so that they're nice and firmly in place as well. So just to explain a little bit about the science of how this works. When you throw a paper aeroplane, you're giving it a forward movement. You're giving it a force forward called a thrust so it can move forward. But what a, what a, um, what this paper plane needs is it needs to be have a little bit of lift as well so as it's going through the air it needs to cut through the air so there's less air resistance and it also needs to be lifted up and that's what happens as this is flying the air currents are going around these loops as well creating lift so it's actually going to fly quite far 
So this is the basic design of the hoop aeroplane. Now, what you can do to make it a science investigation is you can design your own version of this. Now you know how it's made. So you could have one possibly with two different loop with two loops on either side. You could have the um the hoop the hoops in different angles along it. You could have a longer one and a shorter one. And then you can scientifically compare the aeroplanes to see which is the best model, which one's going to go the fastest, which one's going to go the furthest, which one's going to go the straightest. And you can set up your own fair test to test out different designs of your aeroplane. So these are fantastic. And um, some scientists are actually working on a design similar to this for helicopters. They're trying to come up with new technology for helicopters. So again, you just need your cardboard cut into strips and then make them into hoops and then attach them onto the main body of your aeroplane. And again, get very, very creative. What happens if you put a weight on it? Will it make a difference if you put a weight on the front or on the back? So a huge amount of science investigations you can do with that. And it's a lot of fun as well. So hopefully you've had fun with that and enjoyed it and you've discovered a little bit more about what makes aeroplanes fly. You could even try flying it backwards, see what happens. OK, so the next um, investigation I'm going to do with you is all about acids and bases. So when when scientists are examining different materials, they sometimes put the materials into different categories or they create categories to understand a little bit more about the behavior of certain substances or objects. Now, one of the categories is, is something an acid or a base and they are opposites. So something can be very acidic, very basic, a little bit acidic, a little bit basic, or neutral in the middle. Now, that's one of the categories, and it's really, really good to understand that as well. So you want to know if you um, if you put a very strong acid on your skin, it would actually burn through your skin. So it's very important that we understand about different substances and liquids and things like that. So one of the ways we can do this, and you can do this in your classroom as well, is you can um, use red cabbage juice to create your own indicator. So an indicator is a liquid that changes colour depending on whether something is an acid or a base. So if you get a red cabbage, take off the leaves, put it into a bowl and just put in hot water into it and let it soak for a while. After a while, the water is going to turn a very purple colour. Drain out the water and then fill it up again and you can make more red cabbage juice. Wait till it cools down before you start using it. So um, with your red cabbage as well, what you can do is, and I'm just going to show you guys an example here that I have. So here is my red cabbage juice and you can see it's a purple color. So with your red cabbage, when it's a neutral, it's going to be this purple color. But if I add an acid into it, it's going to change color and go to a pink or kind of red color. That's how you know it's an acid. But if it goes to a blue or a green, you know that it is a base. And the colour it changes tells you what the pH or exactly how acidic or basic the substance actually is. So you can do this with liquids or with powders as well. And you can test out lots of different materials at home. So I'm going to show you the first one here. So here we've got our red cabbage juice and I'm going to add an acid into this. And we'll see if it changes colour. There we go. So we know that this substance is an acid. But if we add a base into it, it, it is then going to change, change colour and go to a more blue or a green colour. So here's my base. And here's my acid. 
And you can try this in the classroom as well. Just make sure that you're testing out materials that are safe. So double check with your teacher. If you're trying this at home, double check with your parents first before you try anything. So you could try things like washing up liquid, toothpaste, sugar, um, fizzy drinks. So have a think. Always do your prediction. So what do you think that substance is going to be? Is it going to be an acid, a base or a neutral? Remember to write down your results as well so you know which is which. And and then you can calculate is it an acid or a base or a neutral so that's a really really fun science experiment that you can do in your classroom as well so thank you all so very much um, my name is sarah clear with the rediscovery center and this video has been um, funded by me the libraries thank you very much bye bye